I looked at the, the, the letters page and the the letter began as a former Episcopalian priest and now as an Orthodox priest, I believe something like this. I thought, wait, what? Uh, as, a, as a former Episcopalian and now an Orthodox, is that possible? Okay, welcome everyone to the Orthodox Christian Podcast. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Father Lawrence Farley. And why don't we just cut straight to the chase, Father Lawrence, uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what you spend your time doing. Ah, well, bless your heart. Um, yes, my name is Father Lawrence Farley. I'm the pastor of St. Herman's Orthodox Church, which you can probably tell by the, uh, the get up, by the cassock and the pectoral cross. I came to the church uh, uh, to st start the mission of St. Herman of Alaska in 1987, when it was a little enthusiastic, uh, pretty broke, uh, a dozen or so people in the backyard of some very pious and wonderful people. Dr. Edward and Mrs. Um, Vivian Hartley started the church in the backyard in 1987, and it's kind of grown from there. So that's what I do with my time. I, I am the pastor of this wonderful little congregation. Uh, in what spare time I have, I also write and blog and podcast and things like that. So I've gotten a few books out published by uh, Ancient Faith Ministries and St. Vladimir Seminary Press and St. Tikhon Seminary Press and uh, Sebastian Press. Um, so I and I so I uh, a, a weekly blog is produced and it's podcasted and that pretty much takes up all of my all of my spare time between between taking care of this w wonderful congregation and uh, trying to have a somewhat wider ministry of of teaching and catechesis in the larger church. And how many books have you written at this point, Father? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think I'd have to count. There's the, there's the 13 in the New Testament series, and I think there's probably about another dozen or so. So I think 25 or 6 or something. I'd have to count, but um, a lot. Currently, I'm just uh, proofing uh, my 586-page commentary on the Psalter, going through it verse by verse. Of course, it's the entire Psalter, so that take that's that's, and I and I've uh, produced my own Hebrew translation, so that's why it's five hundred eighty six pages. That's a, that's a lot of Psalm, and then you've got to comment on it as well. So, uh, like I said, I'm uh, um, uh, uh, described as a preacher and and writer, perhaps in equal measure. Yeah, definitely pretty prolific with the writing. And obviously you weren't always, or perhaps it's not obvious, but from what I know of your story, you weren't always an Orthodox priest. You weren't always part of the Orthodox Church. So tell us a little bit about your religious background and how you first encountered Orthodoxy. Um, sure. I I came rather the long way around. To just say I was born in thousands of years ago in the 1950s uh, to a little Protestant uh, in, in, to the United Church of Canada, which was a um, um, liberal Protestant denomination um, uh, to uh, wonderful loving parents, but who are not practicing Christians in the sense that they didn't go to church Christmas and Easter sort of a thing. Um, and so not knowing Jesus Christ in any uh, real uh, and lasting way when I was growing up, I, you get bored with Sunday school. And so I dropped out of Sunday school and it was one of these um, agnostic teenagers, which is to say, uh, full of arrogance, stupidity, uh, and think that you know all sorts of these things when you actually know less than nothing. Um, but I did think that if you just live 70 years and you get kind of uh, extinguished, annihilated, crushed out like a new cigarette butt, that's, that, can't, that can't be right. There's, there's gotta be something more to you living your allotted 70 years and then, you know, um, oblivion. So I tried to figure out what was going on and it looked like the Christians had an idea. So I went back to the United Church looking for answers, not the most obvious place to look for uh, truth, I now think, but at any rate, but I managed to find some wonderful um, young people my own age. This was in the 1970s, which is to say the Jesus People movement was 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 still on. If you blink, you missed it. It was only for about 10 years or so, starting in California and spreading um, mostly in North America. Um, uh, very uh, kind of charismatic, speaking in tongues, Bible pounding, prophesying, sort of uh, high voltage evangelicalism. And so I had my conversion to, to Christ through the Jesus People movement with some help from uh, uh, John Stott's basic Christianity, John Stott being an Anglican uh, priest in, uh, uh, formerly um, in, in London. And of course, for my hero, C.S. Lewis, having read his mere Christianity, blew my mind. And so I uh, gave my life to Christ through the charismatic Jesus movement. Um, 
and still in the United Church of Canada. And the United Church of Canada was becoming more and more liberal pretty much with every passing day. And I was becoming perhaps more conservative with every passing day as a part of the tongue speaking, prophesying Jesus, Jesus people movement. And I thought, I think I'm in the wrong place. This was, this was especially so because the United Church of Canada began in 1825, with the uh, institutional union of a bunch of Presbyterians, pretty much all the Methodists and all the Congregationalists, like I said, began in 1925. My mother, however, began in about 1920, and I figured the church should be maybe a little older than your mom. Uh, so I was looking around for a church that had some sort of historical rootage and uh, historical lineage. Of course, if you're a Protestant, you don't uh, you don't fish outside the Protestant pool, you know, you, you, you get subtly steered away from the Catholics because, oh no, a Catholic. So, and so, the, uh, but I did have some friends who were part of the Anglican Church of Canada, and I attended the Anglican Church of Canada, and I thought, this seized my heart, this captured my heart, this said the sense of um, uh, um, a penitential kneeling before God, like they had kneelers, which the United Church didn't have. Mm. Carrying, carrying the cross in procession, singing, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It was this sort of liturgical transcendence that, that I was looking for. I had a wonderful, wonderful parish priest there, the late Father Bill Newton, um, formerly of St. Ninian's Parish that, that, that I joined. So I left the, left the United Church and became card-carrying Anglican. This was uh, from in about 1970, 1971. You say thousands of years ago when I was in high school. Um, so and if I can I, just pause you there for a second, I, Father, just yeah. to jump in and sort of summarize. So you were originally United Church, but more nominal in a sense, yeah. joined the Jesus movement. And then from there, uh, it, that, the Jesus movement, it sounds like was actually within the United Church that you're attending. Is that correct? No, it was a very much an international uh, uh, and uh, interdenominational group. Um, Hmm. Probably not a whole lot of United Church people in there is my guess, uh, because United Church was committed to liberalism to the point of drafting their own so-called new creed in 1968, famous for not for omitting things like the virgin birth and other stumbling blocks to our liberal friends. Um, so probably not a whole lot of United Church people in this in, in this charismatic movement. There was a it was a um, a group that met every Thursday. Uh, evening in downtown Toronto called Catacombs, founded by Mervyn Merle Watson. Um, uh, and so I th there might have been a couple of thousand young people there, uh, you know, big, uh, this was before the days of praise bands, but you still had people playing guitars and stuff like that, uh, singing charismatic choruses. So, um, and it was within this context of chorus singing that there would be tongues and prophecy and things like that. Um, so it was very interdenominational. And so you, we would have considered ourselves primarily Jesus people who happened to be going to a Baptist church or to an Anglican church, or if you're really odd, a uh, United church. And of course the Catholics had their own version of it as well at this, at the, at the same time. But I think it's fair to say that in those days of the uh, charismatic renewal, uh, especially in catacombs, there was a certain amount of, how do you say it, ecumenical ecumenicity, you know? They, you, you, mm -hmm. could, you could consider yourself to be primarily a Christian and maybe a charismatic Christian, and then your denominational identity was of rather lesser concern, kind of, you know, oh, by the way, I'm also a Catholic or something like that, you know? So, um, right, right. Well, so that, that was me um, becoming a, a um, uh, card carrying Anglican, had an Anglican by conviction. And so, and uh, the, um, of course, the more you keep on uh, reading and, you know, join the Anglican Church because they had a whole 400 years of church history, that, that makes me smile as an Orthodox, a whole 400 years, but at any rate, um, but, uh, but it beats being born in 1925, sort of thing, you know, denominationally speaking. So, um, but of course, so I went through, got my BA in the Anglican Trinity College in University of Toronto, and then since I was heading towards uh, the Anglican priesthood, Wycliffe College in Toronto. And and there, um, it was okay. It wasn't exactly St. Vladimir Seminary. You know, they didn't, they, uh, how much did they talk about the fathers? Uh, not at all, actually, but whatever. You know, they were, you, you could still read history books. You still, they had, they had subjects called church history, which in the charismatic renewal, they didn't, you know, church history doesn't go back much beyond Azusa Street in the, it was about 1907 or something like that. So there's not a whole lot of, church history happening. And in fact, in a lot of the evangelicalism generally and charismatic renewal in particular, there was almost a total amnesia blackout for a history that began um, prior to the 20th, the 20th century. 
So as, as an Anglican, you do learn about church history, whether you like it or not. And that tends to give you a sense of historical perspective. It tends to uh, erode a, a simplistic fundamentalist view of stuff. Um, and it kind of it has the effect of broadening you to have a greater appreciation for liturgical worship. Helped to be reading C.S. Lewis, of course, um, and, and things like this. So I uh, became less and less of a charismatic evangelical and more and more of a charismatic Anglican, and then more and more of an Anglican who had charismatic roots. It was that sort of a, a growth. Uh, looking back on it, um, with the hindsight of a 70 year old, I realized that I was actually heading towards orthodoxy, though I wouldn't. I did not know orthodoxy was out there, uh, but 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 that was me. So I was a uh, uh, an Anglican priest ordained for the Anglican Church in 1979. I had uh, two uh, um, two parishes in northern Saskatchewan under a very wonderful bishop, the late uh, H. V. R. Short, um, Vickers Short, um, and uh, uh, resigned my Anglican priesthood in 1985 to be received into into the Orthodox Church after a. Um, Two weeks non catechumenate as it were. I was, I was, uh, I had resigned my priesthood. I was going to the Orthodox Church, but the, but the, uh, the chaplain of the Orthodox Mission that I was that I was received that was on vacation for those two weeks, so I had zero catechumenate. Came back and chrismated me, my wife, and my two little girls, ages uh, at that time three and one, um, uh, before zipping off to St. Tikhon's that fall. Sure, okay. Daniel's okay, back, and but, just but. If we can pause the uh, narrative there for another moment, uh, two questions that come to mind are, and I think this is kind of a theme with some of your writing is um, liberalism and conservatism. And you mentioned yeah. that with uh, the United Church and you were becoming more conservative in your theology. You were noticing that they were more liberal in their theology. And um, that could be sort of a theme that goes throughout the different yeah. transitions even past the United Church. So uh, two questions that come up. One, and it's it's fairly large, but if you could define liberalism and conservatism in relation to Christianity, that would be probably really helpful for, for people listening. And then as a second question, um, just with Anglicanism in particular, if you could talk about the kind of Anglicanism you were part of, because I know that there are low Anglicans, there's high Anglicans, uh, different uh, appreciations for liturgy in the Anglican church. So those two questions would be awesome. Okay, perfect. Um, um... By theologically liberal and theologically conservative, so I, I, I put the I put um, the descriptor in there. I'm not talking about political liberals or political conservatives. I'm not, you know, that, that ain't what I'm talking about at all. You can vote however you like. Um, but in terms of the theological liberalism, I would define it as uh, um, what you choose to believe, uh, how you the the worldview that you inherit, or the the theological worldview that you inherit, and how you live and act as a Christian, is determined primarily by uh, um, the the secular culture around you. So that you look at how people believed in the past, uh, uh, those uh, whether there it's the apostles who wrote the New Testament, or whether it's a sub sub apostolic period, or whether it's the church fathers later, or uh, the, the creators of the councils or any of that stuff. And you say, well, it's, that's interesting, but it doesn't bind me in the slightest. You know, I have a, I, I give myself the freedom to dissent from pretty much anything I want. Um, okay, so that's, that rather explains a lot. So, you, for example, if I can go pick on the United Church, they'll, they'll forgive me because they're so sweet. Um, the, um, uh, you couldn't find pretty much anybody in the history of Christianity uh, for the first I don't know, 1800 years that denied the virgin birth, you know, Arius accepted the virgin birth, you know, I, oh, you know, whatever. Um, um, but they give themselves a the freedom to deny the virgin birth on the rather dubious grounds that it's uh, miraculous at that. At, doesn't say very much. Of course, it's miraculous. But at, at any rate, but that's what they say. No, no, we, we don't. We don't believe in the virgin birth because it's scientifically and biologically impossible. OK, so. The, in in choosing to do that, they're essentially giving themselves the freedom to write off everything that came before the nineteenth uh, 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 and twentieth century, um, which is to say that they give themselves the freedom to embrace skepticism. Uh, they, so, whereas if you're a theological conservative, you give a certain amount of weight to Christian antiquity, whether it's uh, 
the fathers, or perhaps if you are an evangelical, uh, never mind the fathers, I don't care about them, but the Bible, you know? So which part, from the, the Orthodox would say, the Bible is read through the fathers, but at any rate, there was the, um, the, the uh, conservatives give weight to parts or, uh, or the entirety of Christian antiquity as defining how they think. So if, if uh, for example, if the Bible says this, then that's what I think. If the fathers thought this, that's what I think. So it's a, I would say the, the deciding factor is what you do with Christian, with Christian antiquity. Uh, do, do you give it weight or do you say it has no weight whatsoever? Um, I will decide for myself what I'm going to believe. Um, th there's, I would suggest uh, gently that there's perhaps uh, a little bit of, a uh, little, little bit of cultural arrogance uh, in there. Um, uh, the, 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 um, what, what C.S. Lewis, I think, called chronological snobbery. The idea is that we are really smart and the guys and the, the, our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-grandfathers and the church fathers and the guys, the, they were all stupid because they believed the virgin birth. We know better. They, they may not say quite as baldly as that, but that's essentially what's going on. That they, if you are a theological liberal, you tend to canonize the unstated, uh, often, presuppositions of your culture. Miracles don't happen. Can you prove that? No, but our culture, that's one of the dogmas of our culture, so it is uncritically accepted. Um, okay, so so I said those are, by, by, by liberal and conservative, that's essentially what I mean. Mm -hmm. So one oh, that sorry. retains what's gone before and another that uh, uh, sort of discards what's being handed down, uh, to put it really simply. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, and then Anglicanism. Um, I, me I remember when I was first um, puzzling out as an Anglican priest, I had to figure out, okay, I think I should join the Orthodox Church. What do I do, Lord? What do I do? And so I phoned up a uh, dear Anglican priest friend of mine, and I said, I'm uh, I think that we Anglicans are in schism from the church. And a little to my surprise, he said, no, of course we're in schism. I thought, wait, what? Wait, wait. Don't, don't tell me that. He said, yeah, look, everybody's in schism from everybody. I thought, he said, look, he said, look, look, look. What you got to do is, he said, you have to figure out, and this was a wonderful, wise priest, a friend of mine, he said, you have to figure out what Anglicanism is. Does it, does it still exist? And do, do you believe it? You got to figure out those three, those, those three things. Okay. So I think I figured out what Anglicanism was and concluded, therefore, that I didn't believe it. So I don't really care if it exists anymore. If, if, if it exists, you, you can keep it. It's all yours. Um, so that, so, and what I, um, to be controversial, what I, I, I was kind of um, with John Henry Newman a little bit in, not in all of his apologia thing, um, being a Catholic and not an Orthodox, so I'm not going to play the sandbox with him for all that long. Um, but he did have a little ap appendix in which he talked about his view of what is the Church of England, of which he was formerly a part before converting to Roman Catholicism, of course. And he said that the Church of England was the ecclesiastical part of the English nation. The, the title says it all. You were the Church of England. It was, it was the state church. And it was created as an act of schism from the rest of Catholic Europe. Um, which had already by then got in schism from the Orthodox East, but that's another discussion. Um, the, uh, so that uh, uh, Henry VIII broke away from Catholic Europe and said, I'll, I'll, run, I'll run the church, not the Pope, thank you very much. Why should the Church of England be run by um, uh, an Italian politician? Which I guess he had a point, but at any rate. Um, and so the, you want to keep the, the Church of England as an instrument for the unity in the state. So that's why the the, the monarch, uh, the king or the queen, is the one who appoints all of the bishops in the Church of England. That's why their prayer book is passed through an act of parliament and it cannot be changed. As, they, as the Anglicans discovered to their frustration in 1928, it can't be changed except by an act of parliament. Um, and you had to go to church in the Church of England or essentially this, the secret service would find you out and do bad things to you, you know? So it was the, um, uh, you, you you didn't have to stay awake in church, but you had to go to church. That was kind of the, the deal. And they had people in church who got a whack over the head with a stick if they if you snored too loudly. I'm not making this up. So, um, so because it was the instrument of this of of the state, um, 
Oh, and and by the way, when the when the prayer book was uh, was was first brought in, there's a number of people in I think it was Northumbria who did not like the prayer book. They thought, no, 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 what's this? This is stupid. We want the old stuff. But their the use of the prayer book was enforced with with significantly with foreign mercenaries. Alrighty then. So, um, so what you had in in the Church of England was a, a fairly broad umbrella, a, a, a big a big tent. Um, if you were a, a, a papist, you're outside the tent. If you were someone that said bag the bishops, uh, or, or pres- you know you're a Presbyterian, or what they what or what the prayer book called in its dedicated epistle, uh, self conceited brethren. Not not very polite, but anyway, if you're one of those two extreme categories. Out you go, but if you if you didn't rock the boat, um, you could more or less believe and worship how you wanted to. You had to use the prayer book, but you could you know do whatever you like. So, the question arises: For example, is the Eucharist a sacrifice? You know, uh, later on in the, church, in the Church of England, you had conservatives, uh, uh, high church guys like E. L. Mascall who said absolutely. You had good high church conservatives like Gregory Dix, author of the Shape of the Liturgy, say absolutely. Is um, and then you had uh, people like John Stott saying absolutely not, you know, or is in the Eucharist do we receive the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ? High church guy said yes. Old church guy says absolutely not, and and you know it's all shades of opinion in between. So uh, it's not just high church and low churches. If the high church and low church were two uh, monolithic blocks, you know, uh, no, they were they were there was um, the reality was that all sorts of theological variety of opinion was tolerated, including super, super liberal guys. That's why I had, uh, honest to God, John John Robinson essentially uh, um, denying lots of the tenets of Christianity, and he's still a bishop. And in the, in the American Episcopalian Church, you had Bishop Pike denying practically everything. You had the, the late Bishop Spong in the, in the uh, e- e- Episcopal Church make a point of very flamboyantly denying everything. And he's still a bishop. So what is it? so? Which party does he belong to? But the point is to to talk about the two different parties, high church and low church, misses misses the point. As long as you're not going to rock the boat, as long as you're not going to say you high church guys have to get out, or you low church guys have to get out and join the papists and the self conceited brethren out there, as long as you're going to find a place for everyone in what was uh, billed as Anglican comprehension, Anglican comprehensiveness, then you can believe whatever you want, or nothing. So. Um, but you're still within the state, the state church. So, uh, what, what if I were, if I were being a little bit mischievous, I would say the only thing that you really need to believe as an Anglican is that you need to be able to say "God save the King," uh, and, and and you know, so it was the uh, the Church of England. The word kind of says it all. Um, it is, Anglicanism has never been as confessional as, say, the Baptists or the Lutherans, or certainly certainly the Catholics. So that, for example, if you talk to a Baptist, as you say, is the Eucharist a, a sacrifice? Is it the body and blood of Christ? No Baptist in the world will say, uh, yes, it is. You know, you will not find the, the degree of theological diversity in Baptist churches, as you will in, in Anglicanism. They'll all say, nope, absolutely, nope, 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 nope. You know, if you ask the Lutherans, uh, classic Lutherans, I mean, the the liberal Lutherans, uh, well, who knows, you know, you can, you can, if you can deny the divinity of Christ, I guess you can deny the real presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist, but whatever. But classic kind of Lutherans, they you ask them a, a straight question, they give you a straight answer. Baptists will give you a straight answer. Catholics will give you a straight answer. You ask five Anglican theologians, you get six different answers. So it was, it was, it was defined liturgically or nationally, one's tempted to say ethnically, uh, not confessionally, there was a, a um, there was a wide latitude of confessional belief uh, tolerated. Like I said, as as long as you didn't mind being one party <clears throat> within the Church of England, as as long as you say there's there's room for everybody, and we can argue with we can argue together inside that one angle content. Um, right. So yeah, was- yeah, and that's the sense that I had of Anglicanism as well. And just to summarize again, that it was a uh, you could say political solution or something to keep the Christians together in the realm of England. And in the realm of England, there were Christians that were very much persuaded by a more Catholic ecclesiology yeah. and practice. There were others that were very, very influenced by the Reformation that was going on in Northern yeah. Europe and wanted to follow after Calvin. 
And essentially, from my reading of it, uh, is you have some people that will have a both and view in the sense that they are sacramental and they will see yeah. that uh, the sacrifice of the Eucharist or it being the body and blood of Christ, etc., isn't in competition with God. Um, whereas you would have others that are more of a reformed persuasion that want to that have a very zealous view of God's glory and want to keep that protected and uh, say, well, we're not going to have any images because, you know, Christ yeah. is the image of God and these things are jeopardizing that or the saints are jeopardizing that. And so yeah. it's, it's very black and white in that camp. But both of those camps are within Anglicanism, which yeah. makes it difficult to have an actual theological identity. And so it sounds like you were beginning to feel that tension and then thrown into the mix in the modern era is the liberal strain of yeah. Christianity, which is actually cutting at the roots of uh, what we've inherited. Yeah, if, if, it, if it had been, if it had not been for the liberal thing, the, the crisis of conscience would not have come quite so um, suddenly uh, and and strongly. I mean, if it was just a matter of saying, well, I'm a high church guy, but we, you know, uh, we tolerate J.I. Packer because he's such a lovely guy, so we're not going to kind of kick him out. Um, for me, the, the crisis came when uh, the, uh, ironically, the Anglicanism that I was converted to, that I fell in love with, and that I joined to find, the Anglican Church of Canada, anyway, was just at that precise moment chucking it out the window as fast as they possibly could. Um, the uh, um, liturgical revision of the prayer book came with uh, mixed results, um, and in particular, the ordination of women came. In fact, I was that I attended uh, as a layman in the back pew, uh, the very first ordination of a woman in Canada. Um, lady, I'm sure she was lovely, but it was Marjorie Pazak, uh, uh, ordained in uh, I think it was St. James Cathedral. Anyway, the the Toronto Cathedral by then Bishop Lewis, uh, Bishop Lewis Garnsworthy. Um, and for me, that was that was the watershed because the people were saying essentially, yeah, I know St. Paul says it uh, that you can't do it. I know that. Uh, the church has never done it. I know that the fathers have said, you can't do it. We're going to do it anyway. Again, how much weight do you give Christian antiquity? Zilch, actually. And so and so this was, it wasn't about the women. It was about how much authority does the scripture have? How much authority do the fathers and, and, the, and the past have? And it was part of a whole wider thing whereby you could, like I said, in the case of Bishop Pike, or uh, later on Bishop Spong, you can deny pretty much anything, and that, and that and that's that's okay. There is room for you. The Anglican Church wants you, and you don't have to believe anything. You can deny pretty much anything you like. So it was this galloping liberalism, of which um, the, the ordination of women was almost a, a symptom and a symbol. I remember uh, Bishop Short, my dear and wonderful bishop. Um, I was, we were talking about it in his office, and he said, well, there are biblical reasons against it, but no theological reasons. And I thought, hold the phone. Biblical reasons against it, but no theological reasons? What, what's your, what are you saying about your theology? You're saying it is, is, is not grounded in the Bible, that the Bible has, in fact, no weight for your theology. So whether, whether that's about women or whether that's about the, the Eucharist or the divinity of Christ or later... Uh, sexual uh, gender issues. I mean, it, 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 if you're, it's a lot like playing tennis with the net down, you know. So I thought, so it, it ain't just about the women. It's about saying we've essentially chucked the Bible out. Uh, we'll accept the we'll accept the bits of the Bible that we want, and the ones that we don't want, we won't. And I, it, when what is reminded of the saying, ascribed to Saint Augustine, have been able to track down the quote. But supposedly Saint Augustine said, if you only believe the bits in the Bible that you like, it's not the Bible that you believe in, it's yourself. But when Saint Augustine yeah. said it, I, I believe that's that 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 defines liberalism. At least it at least it, it defined the liberalism that I was experiencing in the Anglican Church of Canada in the sixties and seventies. Um, I felt as a as a as a parish priest, under like I said, a very wonderful bishop, um, that I was striving to convert the Anglicans to Christianity. I was fighting a, a, essentially a losing rearguard action against uh, galloping liberalism in in in, in my church, um, the erosion of a biblical worldview, the erosion. Well, there wasn't much of a patristic uh, vision left, but what there was that was being fast eroded as well, um, and. 
I, you, you, you get kind of tired of trying to convert the Christians. Like, aren't there pagans out there whom I should be talking to? You know, you got to. So, um, and so the, the, the moment of crisis happened to me when I thought, okay, look, this is getting uh, happening faster and faster and faster. They, I believe, I came to believe that the Anglican Church of Canada was in a state of theological and, and therefore moral free fall. And I thought, you know, if I was, if I was a monk and going to die in a couple of years, who cares, you know? Give me my pension until then, that's fine. Except that I was a married man with a couple of uh, 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 young girls. And I thought, I'm not raising them in this. I'm not going to, you know, 18 years old, they raise them in this as good Anglicans. And they go off to college and uh, go off into the big wide world when they're 18 or 19 and go to the Anglican church down the street, only to find out that they have some, some you know, uh, um, lesbian, lesbian priestess pushing God knows what. I thought to myself, yeah, that ain't going to happen. So I had to figure out. I got to get out. I got to get out now. Yeah, now. <clears throat> and where to go? That's the that's the question. That was the right, right. And and so, did you know about the Orthodox Church, or what was it that put it on no, your radar? They, in in those days, the, the Orthodox Church was outside my experience because I wasn't Russian or Greek. I was a Toronto kid, and going to school at the University of Toronto and in in Wycliffe College, and there were lots of Orthodox churches in. Uh, in Toronto, uh, but they all, all worship pretty much entirely, as far as I can see, in in Greek or Russian or, uh, or Slavonic rather, um, or Romanian or Ukrainian or, or whatever, and they did zero um, uh, outreach to people outside their ethnic identity. It, it was a forgive me. It was essentially the Greek club that hired clergy to do stuff. So I thought, yeah, that's not. I'm I'm not a you, you talking to me? No, because I'm not a Greek. You talking to me? No, because I'm not Ukrainian or Serbian or Romanian. So it was uh it was never an option. It, they clearly were not interested in people outside their own ethnic uh, ghetto, if, you, if I may say that. Um like me. So I thought, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But clearly it's not an option for um English speaking guys. Or so I thought. And so then I was reading a book called the New Oxford Theological Review subscribed to this little thing. It was kind of a conservative thing. It had Orthodox and Anglicans and Catholics and whatever writing in there. And I looked at the, the, the letters page and the, the letter began as a former Episcopalian priest and now as an Orthodox priest, I believe something like this. I thought, wait, what? Uh, as, a, as a former Episcopalian and now an Orthodox, is that possible? So I tracked down the guy. He was apparently the, the, the pastor of a church in in uh, in Florida and figured out how to how to write to him and wrote him a letter and said, what language do you worship in? Fully expecting him to say, you know, uh, Greek, Romanian. Turns out to me he was Western right Antiochian, if you can imagine. He sent me a copy of his service, which is the, <laughs> my prayer book with the, with the filioque removed and stuff like this. So, that, so it is possible. I mean, this was like a revelation. Lights come on, Damascus Road, you know that sort of stuff. I thought, so um, I thought I got to check this out. And the more I checked it out, the more I thought, well, where have you been all my life? And you know, I thought this is, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. I've always believed that. And then I thought I, so for a person who always considered consider that the early church was my church, you know, uh, I'm an Anglican, but my my people are the church fathers, you know, too bad they're all dead and there's, and they're not around. But then, um, so that, then you find out, well, actually, they're still alive. A, a lot of them are speaking Greek, Russian, Romanian, or Serbian, and some of them are speaking English, and some of them left the door ajar so guys like me could come in, and like this person in, in, in Florida. So the more I investigated, the more I thought, this is my church. I, the, the way home from schism, is a possibility, you know. Um, so you you investigate, you find as many contacts as you can, then you 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 discover Schmemann and Meinorf and Hopko and things like Vladimir's, and people are very very kind to you. Um, and so yeah, so that was why I thought I gotta okay, I'm in. I gotta, I gotta throw away the oars and 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 stay and stay ashore. You know. So that was in when was that? That was in about 1984, uh, and I told my uh, Anglican bishop, I, I think I got to resign my orders. Not something that a bishop wants to hear because it's harder to find guys to fill those parishes. And he said, look, could you take a, take a year to pray about it? 
Okay, so he didn't take a year to pray about it. I went back to him and said, no, I, I still got to get up. He said, well, God bless you. He was he was kind and supportive and sympathetic. Um, he was retiring himself. So, you know, it, 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 finding my replacement was going to be somebody else's problem. So that's probably good for him. Um, but yeah, but that was what I, I, I discovered orthodoxy as a, as a possibility through uh, chance reading. Or if you believe in chance, I would suggest a providential exposure to this letter that this former Episcopalian Orthodox guy wrote in, in the New Oxford Theological Review. But it is possible. So, yeah, so. yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. So, um, you've already mentioned some of the reasons why in a uh, somewhat indirect way in terms of what you were um, taking issue with or what was challenging about some of the other uh, jurisdictions or uh, denominations, I should say, that you were a part of formerly. Yeah. And if you could summarize um, some of the key reasons why you joined the Orthodox Church, what would those be? Um, it would be because I my my allegiance was always to the early church, and it was apparent that the early church is accessible through orthodoxy. I mean, it doesn't it it's it would be fatuous and silly to say, and it hasn't changed in ancient. Well, yeah, of course, it's changed. It, 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 more brocade, you know, larger dioceses, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, more nationalism than there was in the early days. I mean, in the days of Byzantium, when there weren't nations, there was rather less nationalism. But I mean, it was the. Um, but essentially, I I came to believe that the West was in schism from the East, uh, and and the, and the, the problems that were afflicting the West weren't afflicting the West because the Western people are stupid or bad, uh, but 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 because they were pious, intelligent people. But in schism, these the uh, the liberalism which was afflicting it, um, the uh, I'm trying not trying not to, trying not to use the word heretical, but the heretical things in the West. I'm th thinking of John Calvin, God love him, um, uh, afflicted the church. This this is what happens when when church goes into schism, when the West goes into schism from the East, there's problems there and you want to continue in the Western trajectory instead of finding your way home from that. So you go further into schism, you know? So this is what, so all of the, the things that I was experiencing as negative parts of my experience, like, like for example, liberalism and the Anglican churches, toleration people like John Spong, but this, I thought this is what happens when you're in schism. It's the fruit of schism. That you, you almost can't blame the people for it. I mean, we're all responsible for packing our own shoots and our, our, our decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought, but if you're in schism, kind of, what do you expect? You know, that th things are things are going to get dramatically weird sooner or later. So, and, so and would you say that it's similar to having like um, a framework or some ground rules to to play Christianity within? And orthodoxy gives you. Uh, ones that work and last and that other yeah. uh, traditions might give you rules that that work at the time, but there's something that's incomplete and therefore there are these uh, deviations that are uh, unusual and unhelpful. Yeah, I would. I think what the, the, the big word for the orthodox is, of course, the T word uh, tradition and tradition doesn't mean, as you know, um, a rival source of authority apart from scripture. If you're tend to be in the West a little bit. You talk about scripture and tradition. If you're an evangelical or a Protestant, you say, uh, Bible's wonderful, man's tradition, you know, mere tradition, that sort of stuff. You usually define tradition fairly, fairly negatively. Um, that's not what we, as you know, what we Orthodox mean by tradition. The word tradition comes from the Greek uh, uh, word aperdosis, uh, meaning something that has been handed on to you. The, the para part means beside and the dosis part means to, to give. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so tradition is something that someone comes and comes beside you and gives to you. Or in the, the, the Greek word is uh, the, the verb form is the word para, para, um, para didomi, which means again, to come beside somebody. And so it, it's usually translated to deliver. So if someone comes beside you and de delivers you a teaching. That's what we mean by tradition. And for us, Tradition includes the entire apostolic package, which includes the New Testament. 
and therefore the the apostolic reception of course of the old testament as well what the apostles meant by the scriptures so instead of saying we got scripture and tradition we say we have tradition a part of which is scripture and we uh, the uh, we ac we access the meaning of what the scripture means through the lens of tradition through the lens of the church fathers the church fathers gives us uh, a way of, of accessing what the apostles taught all over the place because if they if they have a church father in in britain or gaul or asia minor it's all talking the same thing that's not a coincidence they're talking the same thing and they have that consensus because they got it from the apostles so um the the consensus patron the consensus of the church fathers that's the lens through which we read the bible i mean everybody's got a lens you can fess up to the fact that you got a lens or you can deny it and say no the holy spirit guides me as a matter of fact everybody has a lens so we're clear that our lens is that of the consensus of the fathers that and now it enables us uh to read the scriptures in the patristic way um other people could have as a lens of what john calvin said or what the westminster confession said or what the pope said or what benny Hinn just said last week or whatever i mean but, but everybody's got some sort of a lens no one because the bible is not a book but a library it, it, if you're going to take that library and said here's doctrine here's how we should run our services um, you, you're going to need a lens to do that and i think that what happened uh in uh, in, the, in the west is that the the patristic lens got collapsed into the papacy and that created some problems and then but there's some people reacted to the problems by saying uh we need to get rid of the Pope as the lens. Well, we don't actually need a lens. The Bible is perfectly clear. We, you know, the, and so, um, uh, you know, the Bible is our creed, whatever that means, that sort of stuff. And so, so I think that's, that's the problem. That's why I think that you have um, in the West and in Protestantism, very pious, good, um, uh, honest, smart guys coming up with radically different understandings of what's in the Bible because it's because the um, a lot of the teaching in the Bible is is not clear it needs an interpretive lens um, and if they don't have the that's why all the Orthodox more or less sort of kind of agree about stuff whereas in Protestantism there is tremendous theological and doctrinal diversity or to say chaos but but nonetheless but you know, there's certainly certainly the, theological diversity Yes, yes. Yeah, and I think another important point there is probably that the um, the foundation of orthodoxy is in the liturgy itself. And so the yeah. place that the Bible finds its home is in liturgy, which historically speaking was the case. These were, say, epistles written to church communities that would be read aloud in yeah. the community as they're gathered to worship God. Yeah. And so uh, one way to see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that yeah. orthodoxy has continued that tradition and yeah. we do start to get some of these strange readings when people uh, take scripture out of that context of that uh, worship yeah. context into their own home and and it's not not bad obviously to read scripture at your home but if that's uh now the main place where interpretation happens rather than in the community of believers there's all sorts of strange readings that can occur there and also i should say that that community of believers isn't just those that are living but it's those that have gone before that's right it's, it's what um, it's what uh, G.K. Chester, that well, one of my favorite authors, talked about uh, the democracy of the dead. You know that we we give a, a vote to that most obscure class of people, our ancestors. So, so you say, what does the church say about, for example, the ordination of women? You don't just check with uh, Father Lawrence. You check with Athanasius and Augustine and, and all those other guys, because they're 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 still a they're still a part of the church. And so, um, if the the, the Orthodox would say, and, um, and and possibly the Catholics too. I suppose it depends which Catholic you're talking to. Um, that the interpretation of Scripture, instead of being a radically atomized individualistic project, you know, me and the Holy Spirit, we I, I read it and I, I know what it means. That we would say that it's it's the Church which interprets what what the Scriptures mean, and that therefore that is a, an international project because the Church is international, and it is an intergenerational project. And and the fathers from previous generations have their have have their voice as well, um, so that's uh, that saves you. 
decision from me if, if you know what i mean if if, if the, the church will decide what it means you're not at the mercy of father lawrence being a genius which is a very good thing because he's because he's not and so um uh it, it's it's the same way about liturgy or come to that the lectionary the, the church gives you the liturgy as an intergenerational as an international gift um the lectionary, which is part of our liturgical thing um, and the nice thing about it is that it saves you from from the individual pastor creating the liturgy or it saves you from the, from the individual pastor saying here's what we're going to read today i decided you know and so i have a um my 15 favorite lessons and we're going to and we're going to read them over and over and over and over again no you get to the the lectionary saves you from my preferences the the liturgy saves you from the limitations of my liturgical creativity the the fact that we still have the creeds and the ecumenical councils and the fathers and the whole the whole uh church tradition of what we believe by doctrine saves you from uh being limited by my little tiny narrow insights you don't you don't you don't need father lawrence you got the whole church and we would say that the job of any orthodox priest is to much as he can understand uh, internalize that tradition and give it to give it to the people so they, they don't need to hear what Father Lawrence thinks. They need to hear what the what the church teaches, you know. And if you're going to say what Father Lawrence thinks, okay, whatever. If you if you're that bored, but 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 you need to differentiate between the individual opinions of this or that teacher or this or that pastor and the teaching of the church, because it's it's the church's teaching that's that's authoritative. So that if a, a Bishop Spong can disagree with the church, and but in which case if he was orthodox he wouldn't be bishop spong for very long uh, or, or possibly a communicant for very long um but uh, you know uh, disagreeing with it with the church if you're orthodox is not an option if this is if this is what the church teaches the the, the clergy's job is to say all men do it and to, and to pass it on uh, as accurately and intelligently and perhaps elega elegantly as they as they can Right, right. And just to throw some definitions in there for people, um, lectionary would just be the church oh, calendar, sorry. more or less, or yeah, the readings right. throughout the year. That's right. I'm sorry. I should and have then said liturgy that. as well. Yeah, that, um, the, the, the lectionary is the list of what lessons you read at your church services. Um, the liturgy is a for spectacular oversimplification, is the text that you say when you come together for worship. And, and the fact that you venerate icons the fact that you have incense, the fact that you, you know, uh, wear, wear heavy, that the clergy are forced to wear heavy brocade during hot days, you know, you don't, you don't get to, it would make more sense to wear a Hawaiian shirt, uh, but you don't get to do that. You have to wear your sticker and your phalone and, you know, that's a part of the liturgical tradition as well. Mm -hmm. So just to return to your story again, um, Maybe you can do a condensed version of joining the Orthodox Church to where you are today, or a close approximation of that, as well as any challenges that came up along the way in joining Orthodoxy. And that could just be very practical in terms of going from the Anglican structure, where there's perhaps more financial support to Orthodoxy, which is very new in North America, but that could also include things that were more theological nature. So maybe there are things in Orthodoxy yeah. that just took a little while to get used to, um, maybe in the movements, in the ceremonies that were somewhat unusual at first. Okay, sure. Um, well, when I decided that I that I had to come home, there were a couple of three stumbling blocks that I had to get over because um, I, I knew what I was supposed to believe, but I couldn't figure out why. They were... Um, the veneration of icons, they were the role of uh, the Theotokos in the, in the church and the invocation of saints, the fact that you can talk to St. Paul and he'll hear you. Um, and it was so much taken for granted by a lot of Orthodox pastors that when you when you ask them the question, they, they couldn't figure out what you were asking, you know? They couldn't figure out, well, of course, the, of course the mother of God is perpetually virgin, duh. How could you think otherwise? And I thought, well, a lot of guys do, and you, and you still just can't say, you know, because no, you gotta. So there was, you know, and how do you know that St. Paul can hear you? I mean, again, you ask an Orthodox priest, and it goes, well, because he can. I thought, yeah, but that's not an answer. So I needed to uh, dope out uh, with uh, with doing lots and lots of reading, praying, thinking, and uh, 
pacing up and down. Um, uh, the answers to those three things, those were the stumbling blocks that I had to, I had to come up with answers with, with, uh, with that before I could, with conscience, you know, pray the, pray the liturgy. If you, if you don't want to talk to the mother of God, you can't get through Vespers, that sort of stuff, you know? So yeah, most holy Theotokos save us. If you don't want to say this, you got a problem. So, um, so I had to come up with, with those, with those things. Um, the, uh, that's the theological thing of more practical significance, I suppose, if you want to talk about it in terms of feeding your family, was that um, I was trained to do precisely nothing. I went from converted in, in high school, knew, knew that I wanted to be a clergy. So I went straight from high school into my arts degree, getting a, a BA with mostly in religious studies, and then straight into seminary, getting my MDiv, and then straight into my first parish, which is to say, I'm trained to do precisely nothing except to be a clergy. You know, what skills do you have? Zilch, you want a Bible study, I'm your guy. But if you want to change oil in your car, I'm not your guy. I can't be a mechanic. I can't be a plumber or a carpenter. It's, so how, how are you going to make your living? Um, so this is a problem. Um, and I said uh, to myself and to the Lord, look, I could never be a worker priest. Uh, never say never say that to the Lord, you know. But he's, so it turns out I was a worker priest for like eight years. You know, I could almost could all, look, looking back on, I could almost hear the angels the angels chuckling. You gotta you gotta you gotta tell God what you're gonna do, are you? We'll see about that. Um, but the real the real problem was, of course, that I was um, an Anglican priest in northern Saskatchewan without a whole lot of opportunity to visit Orthodox churches on Sunday morning because I'm doing my own. So you try to visit some Orthodox churches, find them in English. They're really hard to find in northern Saskatchewan. The first Orthodox service I went to was in Ukrainian church in, in Meadow Lake where I was. It was all in Ukrainian. Uh, it was actually Obednitsa in not a divine liturgy because it was in the afternoon. I didn't know that. Like I said, it was, it was all in Ukrainian and the priest had zilch interest. Uh, of talking to somebody that, that wasn't Ukrainian. Could have cared less, but okay, so this is a problem. So, um, and then what do you do? Like if you're in Northern Saskatchewan, but I was, a, uh, when I was uh, ordained down in Toronto and uh, essentially hired by the Bishop for Northern Saskatchewan, the parish paid to move me from Toronto with all my stuff, not a lot of stuff, but you know, I had a bed and a chair from Toronto to, to Northern Saskatchewan. But if you resign your orders as they did in 1985, they don't pay to move you back to Toronto. Yeah, fair enough. And so it, it costs more to move your stuff than the stuff's actually worth. So all that would not fit into a five by five by a U-Haul. We just simply abandoned and you know, here's a couch for free, or you can pay me five bucks for it, whatever. You know, sort of so so this was a problem. Um so the um, uh, eventually talking to the Metropolitan Theodosius of Blessed Memory, who was the locum tenens of Bishop for Canada at that time. And he said, well, we got to figure out what, what we're going to do with you, because you don't know how to swing a censer even, you know what I mean? You, what do you know? You're an Anglican. So we're going to send you to St. Econ's for a year, or as it turns out, two. Um, and then we'll figure out what to do with you. So, um, so they were, um, so again, so you, you put the the wife and the kids on a plane. They take. They go back to the back to Toronto to live to live with the folks. I drove the U-Haul from Northern Saskatchewan to to Toronto and then down to St. Econ's and tried to make something there. And we were there for a couple of years. Um, so we were. It was it was hard because we were really 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 broke. Uh, we had saved up enough money for a year. Turns out to be they said in a sweet sort of way, you are so ignorant. They didn't say it like that, but th th that was. You need to be here for at least two. Uh, three would be nice, but two at least. So that's okay. I had money for, for one. So we're we're pretty broke. But there were some wonderful, wonderful people at St. Econ's. Um, uh, and we, you know, survived and learned and um, steep learning curve as it was uh, before coming out to uh, a little tiny mission, like I said, in the, the backyard that had about 12 people in it or so, was went from the Ukrainians, they, they were nominally under to the OCA, because I was OCA, and uh, started out, um, moved from the backyard eventually. But it, it did require to be for, to work in a full-time secular job as a part-time for, I think it was eight years or something like that. So it was it was interesting. But so the, the, the real difficulties were uh, taking a deep breath and then jumping into the deep end of the pool financially. I have no idea how we're gonna survive 
and feed the family, but I'm doing it anyway. So my advice to those converting is don't worry about the money. God will provide somehow. But, it, but it's it's hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's quite a story at your parish because uh, from going from a backyard with just 12 people, I know that you're now um, constructing a brand new uh, parish building uh, yeah. that is probably one of the first in this area in terms of at least your jurisdiction with the Orthodox Church of America. Um, yeah. And for those listening, it's also in Canada, the Orthodox Church of America, That's but cool. it's quite a remarkable journey. And and how long um, from start to end has that been from the backyard to the uh, new building? Uh, since I, 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 hard to do the math, I think 36 years, anyway, since 1987. I'd have to get my little calculator and do the thing, but I think I think I think 36 years. Um, and there were some rental places, obviously. From um, I remember we got um, kicked out of a couple of them, uh, some in a nicer way than others. Um, we were renting uh, a disused Anglican church and a, and a disused United Church, and um, had to leave both of those places before we were quite ready. But the, the Lord, the Lord was mercy. The Lord was merciful when we got essentially kicked out of the Anglican Church. We learned instantly that there's this possibility of renting the United Church. And then we, much later, were asked to leave there a little more politely. Uh, uh, this other uh, uh, building, we, without coming onto the the, uh, the real estate market, we learned they, they learned from our plight in the newspaper that we, we, we got to leave. Where are we going to go? And they contacted us to say, you know, you can, you can buy our building before it came on the market. So there were some uh, spectacular, almost unheard of miracles that, that the Lord uh, came through for us in, 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 our, in our hour of need time and time again. So I, I would suggest that in many ways, the existence of St. Herman's and certainly the existence of the building that's up there now, all three cupolas of it, um, is a testimony to the faithfulness of Christ. That if you, if you if you turn to him saying, Lord, we have no hope except you, the Lord will not let you down. The Lord will bail you out. He is in the midst of his people. And from those 12 people to today, I know it's sometimes hard to measure exactly how many congregants um, or parishioners there are at a, at a given bar- parish, but just a rough estimation, the size of the um, parish today. Were- well, it's it's the, it's a summer, so people are on on vacation. Uh, so, but they were about 115 on Sunday. Um, there would be there would be more, but except that we we founded some wonderful uh, daughter missions. Um, the the church in uh, in Victoria uh, was founded by uh, one of our guys that I baptized and sent off to seminary. Uh, the church uh, Saint Barnabas in Comox, pastored by a wonderful person, Father Father Alexis Nickel. Uh, he was baptized at Saint Herman's and sent out to start the daughter parish there. Um, Saint Saint John of Shanghai Mission, wonderful pastor, Father. Father Justin Hewlett was also baptized at St. Herman's and, and started out there. So, um, and so there and the uh, wonderful uh, American Antiochian Parish of, of St. Innocence in Everson, Washington State. They were catching Father Mel, wonderful priest and his wonderful people. They were catching their breath for a little bit at St. Herman's for a few years before before starting the missions there. So the there's these daughter missions kind of scattered throughout. If all the kids had stayed home, we'd be bigger. But you know, the, the, um, uh, the young men had a, uh, had a sense, and maybe not so young men in the case of Father Alexis, who's sort of kind of my age, um, uh, had a sense of calling. And they, and they wanted to build something uh, for orthodoxy and for and for and for Christ someplace else, and so they kind of s- spread out into Comox in Victoria, North Vancouver, and and uh, and the other places as well. Okay, okay, and that's that's helpful context so that you've actually uh, been spreading quite a bit. And just two last questions as we wrap up. One is you mentioned some of these hurdles that you had initially in terms of um, honoring the saints or venerating them, and uh, and the Theotokos being sort of the chief among the saints. How did you overcome that? And can you also explain for some people listening the difference in orthodoxy between uh, giving honor to a saint or venerating a saint versus uh, worshiping God? Um, the short version of it, in, I'm looking at the time and thinking, you probably don't have another hour, uh, was that I had to question uh, in, in, in looking uh, over at the questions of um, uh, uh, 
the Theotokos and the saints, I had to dig back a little deeper and examine some of the unexamined previously theological presuppositions that I made. You know, what is, for example, what is worship? What is veneration? Um, classically, there's there's two different words, uh, oddly translated, depending upon where you go. There's Latria, which is adoration, the worship that is given to God alone. It's not given to anybody, not to the mother of God, not to St. Paul, not to St. Herman, not to anybody else. Latria is, is for God. And then there's uh, Dulia. Or, or Dulia is a is the honor that you would give to someone. So, for example, uh, there's there's different types and degrees of dulia. The the honor that you would give to your boss at work is is one. The honor that you would give to um, your your sovereign, the uh, the queen or the king of England, uh, would be a, a little more, a little little different. Um, you would you would do lots of bowing or perhaps curtsying to your sovereign. You probably wouldn't to your boss. Um, um, and again, you you have a certain amount of um, uh, love for uh, your parents uh, that's a different love than you would have for the bishop you we you know when you when you kiss kiss your mom it's a different kiss than when you kiss the bishop's hand and so the the again you have to examine all these underlying presuppositions that they're the an act of veneration or love or the kissing of a hand or the a bowing or something I guess takes its meaning from the the underlying relationship I have a certain underlying relationship with my mom, or I had, uh, have a certain underlying relationship with, with my wife, or with, uh, I suppose, Queen Elizabeth when she was there, um, or with the bishop. Um, and what the kiss means is determined by that underlying, underlying relationship. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't kiss the bishop's hand in the same way as you kiss your grandchildren's cheek. It's a different, it's a different kiss. You could say, well, a kiss is a kiss. Yeah, no, it's not. And so, so there are there there are degrees and differences and nuances in the complexity of what dulia means when you honor somebody, um, but latria is only given to God alone. It doesn't help that if you're sometimes the word worship is is used to to describe both. So when someone says, "Do you worship the Mother of God?" Some Orthodox would say, "Oh, of course we do." Yeah, what they mean is dulia. What they mean is we venerate her. We would, if you, if you would curtsy or bow before the Queen of England, how much more would you curtsy or bow before the Queen of Heaven? Um, uh, but if by worship you mean latria, that the worship, the, the adoration that you give to the infinite Creator alone, then of course we don't give that because that that sort of that sort of latria or honor to the mother of God, because that's dumb, because she's not God. Um, Orthodox know this instinctively, because we know what our relationship with, with Christ is. We give our lives to Christ in a different way and more completely and totally than we would give our lives to our spouse, or to our children, or to our sovereign, or the boss, or, you know, whatever. Um, so we know these relationships, and uh, the honor that we give to the icons or to the, or to whatever is determined by the by the ongoing relationship. So when someone now says to me, "Do you worship the Mother of God?" I say, "Not only do I not do it; it's an impossibility, because I have a relationship with 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 the Mother of God, and and it's not that of Creator to creation. So it's not possible. It's not possible for me to worship my wife or my mother, because the quality of the relationship that I have it just simply makes it an impossibility." Mm -hmm. Yeah. One way I've often thought of it is that God is the source of goodness and truth and beauty. His saints reflect that to us. And yep. therefore, there is a distinction in the source and those that are mediums, yep. as it were. Um, but we receive goodness and truth and beauty from the saints. It's just that they yep. are not the original yep. source of that. Yeah. It, and it's and it's a little bit like when I say that, you know, does does Mary heal you? What is Mary? It, does Mary heal you, or does she pray to Christ to heal you? I would suggest it's not a it's not a sensible question. Like for example, the our Lord said to the apostles in Matthew ten, He said, "Go heal the sick." Okay, so were, were, was it the apostles healing the sick? Yeah, because the Lord said, "Go heal the sick." But did they do it through their own power? No. So that when 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 Peter lays hands on Aeneas in, in Acts, he says, "Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you." So who healed Aeneas? Was it Peter or was it Jesus Christ? Well, it was both. You can't, you, you can't, you can, you can say the apostles did it through the power of Christ or Christ did it through the apostles. It's the same thing. So again, one, one has to, uh, a lot of theology consists of questioning 
the unexa previously unexamined presuppositions of the of the questions that you have and and, and where you start out. Wonderful. And then the last uh, question I do have for you, Father, we do have a number of people listening that are interested in orthodoxy. Maybe they uh, personally are investigating it, or maybe they know someone in their friend's family that have recently joined the Orthodox Church, and so they're just wondering what it's about. Um, but maybe more so for those that are actually investigating it for themselves, wanting to <laughs> learn more, what would be your advice for someone on that road? My, my advice for them would be twofold, namely, well, three. First of all, ask yourself the question, do you really want to know the truth? Yeah, is it the Lord said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. Do you really, really, really want the truth or are you just dabbling? If you're just dabbling, go away. Don't, don't, don't dabble with orthodoxy. Nothing can be more dangerous. But if you really want the truth, God will, God will reveal it to you. If you don't really want the truth, God will probably not reveal it to you because you don't deserve to talk to God. You know, don't trifle with the most high. But if you really want to know, God will reveal it to you. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as soon as God does that, the enemy gets really interested. I say to my catechumens, as soon as you enter the catechumenate, the enemy has your name and your phone number and your email, and he will expect an attack to come. But if you keep your the shield of faith up um, and trust in trust in God and look to the protection of Christ, you'll be okay. But there will always be a counterattack. As soon as you say, I'm going to pursue the Orthodox Church with, with fervency and with the purity of heart and because I really want to know the truth, there will be a counterattack from the enemy. And, and, and the third and maybe the most important thing is that Orthodoxy is all about Jesus Christ. The temptation is to say, the message that the Orthodox has for the world is this, the beauty of Orthodoxy. It's nothing of the kind. The message that the Orthodox Church has for the world is the beauty of Jesus Christ. We preach not, as St. Paul said, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. So my message to the world is not, look how beautiful Orthodoxy is, but look how glorious Jesus Christ is. The Christ that we present is the Christ in, that lives in the Orthodox Church, as it were. The Christ who has his presence and spiritual epicenter in the Orthodox Church, as opposed to, I don't know, the Mormons or the Kingdom Hall or, or God knows what. So it, in, in that sense, it's the Orthodox Christ that we're presenting to the world but our message is not look how look how great icons are you know or whatever you know or or uh, greek cuisine with lemon or something like that you know our our message is jesus christ and so so that uh, you got to keep him focused the the the, tem the temptation especially if you're uh, maybe a young man is to uh see orthodoxy in a partisan way to say I'm Orthodox, I got the truth now, and you don't, you know? I'm superior to you because I believe in the seven ecumenical councils and I know about theosis or something like that, you know? Uh, no, 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 it's not, don't, stop comparing Orthodoxy with the other people. Make a beeline for Jesus Christ to offer him your life in the fullness of church. Come home to Orthodoxy and find Christ. That would be, that, that would be my message. That's well, a wonderful place to end off, Father Lawrence. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a great and, um, and we'll talk to you again in the future, I'm sure. Bless you. Bless you. Take care. Hey, guys. This is Max with the Orthodox Church Podcast. Thanks so much for checking out that episode. I have a link on the screen right now that is for a Google form. If you have a question about Eastern Orthodoxy, definitely click on that and you can send it over. It will also be in the description of the video, so check that out there. If you have a friend or family member that would benefit from watching this episode, please do send it over to them. And the final thing is if you have a guest in mind, some public figure in orthodoxy that you'd like me to interview, definitely mention that in the comments and I'll see what I can do to get them on the show. Until next time, have a peaceful week.